Hey there, so glad you made it to group this week. My name is Tori. As we approach the end of March, it's important that your group discusses what you're going to be doing next. With the official winter group session coming to a close here at the end of this month, that leaves you with a couple options. Your group can take a break through April, or you can continue on. If you choose the latter, be sure to discuss a plan of what your group will be doing next. Just remember to run any study that your group chooses by your campus pastor for approval. One suggestion for what your group could do next is the 21 days of prayer and fasting that we will be doing as a church in the month of April leading up to Easter. We'll be kicking off our prayer and fasting journey on April 1st. This could be a really great experience for your group to walk through together. Now let's check out part of this weekend's teaching before we dive into our group discussion. There's two passages where Paul refers to scripture in 1 Corinthians 3. He's talking about the process of, you know, like being brand new in your faith versus maturing in your faith. And Paul says, dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in the Christian life. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. You still aren't ready, for you're still controlled by your sinful nature. You're jealous of one another. You quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you're controlled by your sinful nature, and aren't you living like people of the world? And again, Paul wrote that to like the, all the people who lived in the city of Corinth. And another passage in Hebrews, he says, there's so much more I'd like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain, especially since you're spiritually dull and don't seem uh, ready to listen. You've been believers so long now, Here's a key, that you ought to be teaching others. Amen. He's saying you, you believe that Jesus is the Christ and you believe that for a really long time, but by this point, he's, Paul is saying to, to the believers here, he says you need to be teaching what God's already taught you onto somebody else. And he says instead you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You're like babies who need spiritual milk, can't eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Now, let me go back to the board here. Let me give you three characteristics of, of people who are maturing or we're into that process in our personal spiritual faith journey. Here's the first one. People who are maturing in Christ, number one, they're self-feeders of God's truth and God's word. Somebody who's, when a baby's born into the family over here, like a physical baby, if you left a physical baby to fend for itself, it would die. A baby has to have a mom or a dad or someone to love it, to care for it, to cradle it, to protect it, and to feed it. Listen, spiritually, it works the exact same way. If you make the decision to be a believer, a follower, you're striving to be a, a disciple of Christ, and if you're not doing it in a relationship with someone else, that's a tough, tough road to walk. People who are brand new in their faith, they need someone to break it down and to say, here's what God is talking about in Scripture, and here's what it means, and here are different possible ways of how it can apply to our life and our living. When we start maturing in faith, you don't need someone to spoon feed you the truth of God's word. You're already doing it yourself on a daily basis. Our, our older boys will be coming home for, for spring break before too long from college. I promise you, they're not going to let me cut their food and go, eh, here comes the airplane. <laughs> I don't want to, and they don't want me to either. Why? They've progressed beyond the need for mom or dad to cut it into small little square bites and dip it in ketchup and do the airplane, here it comes. Here's a second characteristic of those who are maturing in their faith. There's a growing surrendership to the lordship of Jesus Christ. There's a growing surrendership. And listen, that's not a word. I made it up this past week because I tried to find it and it doesn't exist, but I made it up. <laughs> what does it mean to surrender? To surrender means I lay it down before you. Do you know what this person who's just here checking, do you know what they're laying down before God? Nothing. Why? Because they don't even know if they believe in God. This person who crosses a line of faith, they're just saying, I still don't really know what I believe, but I, I believe I don't want to do it by myself. 
and I believe I need help. And as you begin to grow and then you begin to mature in that relationship, then you eventually get to a point in your head where you're like, oh my goodness, God actually died for me. And if I really believe he died for me and I believe he rose, then I should, I, I should be living for him. Because the life that I'm living in the body, is, it no longer belongs to me. So I, I, need to kinda, I need to take steps to, to kind of get in line here to honor the one who purchased my freedom. Here's the third characteristic for those who are maturing in Christ, and it happens more up at this point up here. We begin to realize this whole thing called the Christian life is not even predominantly about me. We begin to realize it predominantly is about giving him glory, listen, and the way I do it is by loving other people in their journey of discovery to God himself. Do you know what bogs a lot of us down in our spiritual journey when we start? We don't need someone to spoon feed it anymore, but you know where we break down? It's when the focus becomes more inward. You see it in churches all the time, entire churches. Entire churches, if they're not careful, will, be, will begin to develop a selfish inward focus. Meanwhile, the whole community around them is not even being penetrated by the love of Jesus Christ. Do you know why that happens? I'll explain it to you really simply. Because my natural human tendency, and yours as well, is an inward self-benefit, not an external other benefit. If you just throw the sand in the air and let the wind blow it wherever it may be, the human nature in all of us is, well, what about me? What about me? Eventually, we begin to grow when we read passages where Paul, you know, in Philippians says, consider it pure joy. That's James. And then in Philippians, he says, you know, consider others better than yourselves. Look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others in the light of Jesus Christ who gave himself up for them. I think there's another category over here. And the, third, the, the fourth category of some people in the church, I don't know how else to say it, but the, they come to a place where they say, I'm, I'm all in on this deal. And they come to a point where they say, you know what? Everything, honestly, everything that I have, that's the cars, the house, any little bit of change in the bank, clothes on my back, everything, it really does belong to God.